Hi, I'm Courtney. I'm so glad you're here. The NCLEX loves to test on antihypertensive medications, so today we're covering all the high yield points that you need to know. So before we break down each medication, let's make sure we're really clear on what blood pressure actually is. Now, blood pressure is the combination of two factors, and the first is going to be our cardiac output, and that is a combination of our heart rate and our stroke volume. Now, heart rate is how fast our heart is beating, and stroke volume is how much blood is being pumped out with each beat. So as cardiac output rises, our blood pressure is going to go up as well. Our second factor is our systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. Now, this has to do with how constricted or dilated our blood vessels are. Now, the more constricted our vessels are, the more resistance that's going to be present and blood pressure is going to go up. So antihypertensive medications target these two levers. For example, beta blockers decrease heart rate and stroke volume, which leads to lower cardiac output, while our medications like our ACE inhibitors, our ARBs, and our calcium channel blockers cause vasodilation, which decreases systemic vascular resistance. Now, in the end, we get the same result and blood pressure goes down. All right, before we talk about specific medication classes, let's talk about what all antihypertensives have in common because the NCLEX will test you on these key safety points. The first up is hypotension. Now, these medications are designed to lower blood pressure, but they can drop it too low, and that's why we always check blood pressure before administration. And if we have a systolic pressure that is less than 90, we need to hold the medication and notify the provider. Next up is orthostatic hypotension. Now, because these medications reduce blood pressure, clients are much more likely to get dizzy or lightheaded when they stand up. So we always want to teach our clients to change positions really slowly so that we can reduce the risk of falls. And last is rebound hypertension. And this is a sudden dangerous spike in blood pressure that can happen when antihypertensives are stopped abruptly. So we always want to teach our clients to never stop these medications suddenly. Now you can see that each of our medication classes comes with its own set of safety considerations. So let's zoom in on the differences and more importantly, how the NCLEX is going to test you on them. Let's start off with our beta blockers. And these are super easy to recognize because they all end in lol. So this is going to be our metoprolol, atenolol, and propranolol. Now these medications work by blocking the beta adrenergic receptors. This is going to slow the heart rate down and decrease how forcefully that it pumps. So instead of the blood slamming out of the heart like a linebacker, it trades that power hit for a softer, slower squeeze, which reduces cardiac output and as a result, reduces blood pressure. So what does the NCLEX want you to know about this class? Well, the first is that we need to be really cautious when we give these medications to clients with diabetes. Do you know why? Well, this is because beta blockers can actually mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia, specifically tachycardia, because remember, these medications are blocking the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. That means diabetic clients could be crashing and not even know it. So we need to teach them to look for other signs of hypoglycemia, like sweating, confusion, or dizziness. Next up, we need to always check a heart rate before giving a beta blocker. Because remember, beta blockers reduce the heart rate. So if we have a client with a heart rate that's already low or less than 60, giving it could drop them into dangerous bradycardia. That's why if we have a heart rate under 60 beats per minute, we're going to notify the provider before proceeding. And lastly, we need to avoid giving beta blockers to clients with asthma and COPD. Now, this is because beta blockers can also block the beta receptors on the lungs, and that can trigger bronchoconstriction. So if someone's already struggling to breathe, like a client who has asthma or COPD, giving a beta blocker is going to make those respiratory symptoms worse. Next up, we have our ACE inhibitors, and we can recognize these because of their pril endings. So this is going to be our lisinopril, enalapril, and captopril. Now, these medications work by blocking the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor. So if we block its effects, we're going to get vasodilation, which is going to decrease vascular resistance and reduce blood pressure. We can think of this like 20 people crammed into a tiny little elevator. If we suddenly open that elevator up into a big conference room, those 20 people are going to have so much more space and they're going to be under a lot less pressure. And that is the role of our vasodilators. So what does the NCLEX expect you to know about this class? Well, if you remember nothing, I want you to remember angioedema. This is a rare but potentially fatal reaction to ACE inhibitors that causes rapid facial swelling around the eyes, the lips, and the tongue. And this is an emergency because all of that swelling can block the airway. So if a client is taking an ACE inhibitor and the NCLEX mentions burning, stinging, or itching in the face area, 
this is your priority finding. You need to hold that medication, immediately report the symptoms, and prepare to give epinephrine. Next up, we need to remember our dry cough. Now, ACE inhibitors can cause this persistent dry hacking cough, but don't let the NCLEX trick you here. This isn't immediately dangerous. If it doesn't go away or it becomes bothersome, the client might be switched to a different medication, but it's not a priority finding that we need to immediately address. Now, it's important to remember that ACE inhibitors can cause hyperkalemia, which means these medications can raise potassium. So if the NCLEX asks you about dietary choices for clients taking ACE inhibitors, look for options that avoid potassium supplements or salt substitutes because these also contain a lot of potassium. And lastly, ACE inhibitors are teratogenic, which means they can harm a developing fetus. So if the NCLEX asks you about who shouldn't be taking these medications, look for the pregnant client. Now let's talk about our ARBs, our angiotensin II receptor blockers. These are going to be our sartans, so our losartan and valsartan. Now like our ACE inhibitors, these also work by blocking the effects of angiotensin II. Remember that's that potent vasoconstrictor. So they have the same blood pressure lowering effects, but here's what makes them different. They are a lot less likely to cause that dry cough and angioedema. So they're a really great backup for clients who couldn't tolerate ACE inhibitors. But don't forget, just like ACE inhibitors, ARBs still affect that renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, so they carry the same risks for hyperkalemia and teratogenicity, and so the same precautions that we had with ACE inhibitors are still going to apply here. All right, it's time for our first NCLEX quick check. So antihypertensives should be held for a systolic pressure of less than what? Remember, we don't want to give antihypertensive medications to a client who already has a low blood pressure, so we're gonna hold those medications for a systolic pressure of less than 90. Next up, beta blockers are contraindicated in what two conditions? Well, remember, we said they can also affect the beta receptors on the lungs, which is going to cause bronchoconstriction. So we don't want to give these medications to clients with respiratory conditions like asthma and COPD. And lastly, which symptoms should be immediately reported in clients taking an ACE inhibitor? Well, that's going to be our facial swelling or any kind of itching or burning in the face area. These are signs of angioedema, a rare but potentially fatal reaction to ACE inhibitors. Next up are calcium channel blockers. Specifically, these are dihydropyridine types, which are amlodipine and nifedipine. Now, like our ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers also lower blood pressure by causing vasodilation. And they do this by blocking calcium from entering the smooth muscle. Now, because of that vasodilation, we might often see side effects like flushing, headaches, and peripheral edema. Now, these aren't emergencies, but they're common enough that we should expect to see them. Now, our NCLEX standout here is that clients need to avoid consuming grapefruit juice. And this is because grapefruit juice interferes with the liver's ability to metabolize these drugs. And this can increase drug levels and lead to toxicity. We're moving on to our direct vasodilators like hydralazine and nitroprusside. Now these medications directly dilate blood vessels, which can drop blood pressure really fast. So these are often given IV in hypertensive emergencies, and that means we need to monitor blood pressure really, really closely because it's easy to overshoot and drop blood pressure too low. Now hydralazine works really quickly, but it often causes tachycardia, dizziness, and headache. And this is because when blood pressure drops suddenly, the body tries to compensate for this by increasing heart rate to maintain perfusion. And that's why hydralazine is often paired with a beta blocker because it helps control that reflex tachycardia. And nitroprusside is a powerful IV medication used for critically high blood pressure. And the NCLEX wants you to know a couple of things here. The first is that it can cause severe hypotension. So we need to monitor blood pressure continuously when we're giving this. And with high doses or prolonged use, there's actually a risk for cyanide toxicity. And this is because of how the body metabolizes this medication. It's rare, but serious. So we need to watch out for signs of this like weakness, confusion, or altered mental status. All right, let's wrap up with diuretics. Now these are covered in more detail in our full lecture and cheat sheet on diuretics, but for the purposes of blood pressure, this is what you need to know. Now diuretics work by removing excess sodium and water from the vascular system, which reduces blood volume, which reduces cardiac output, and therefore blood pressure is going to go down. Now there is two main types of diuretics. First is our potassium wasting diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide and furosemide. And then we have our potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone. So because we're getting rid of water, sodium, and we're altering potassium levels, we need to be on the lookout for a few things. And the first is electrolyte disturbances. So for our potassium wasting diuretics, we need to be on the lookout for signs of hypokalemia or potassium that's too low. So we need to be on the lookout for muscle cramps, weakness, and irregular heartbeats. For our potassium 
Bearing diuretics like spironolactone, we have an increased risk for hyperkalemia or potassium that's too high. So we want to teach our clients to avoid any potassium supplements or any salt substitutes, which also contain a lot of potassium. The second thing we need to be on the lookout for is dehydration, which makes a lot of sense because we're giving a medication that's causing a lot of water loss. So we need to look out for signs that our client is getting too dry. So low urine output, confusion, or rapid weight loss are all red flags. And lastly, we're going to see increased urination. These drugs get rid of excess water, so increased urination is an expected finding. But this also means that timing of administration is really important because if we give a medication that causes increased urination right before bed, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> well, that client is going to be up all night having to urinate, which is going to cause sleep disturbances and potentially a fall risk. So we always want to give diuretics in the morning so that we're not disrupting sleep. All right, it's time for our last NCLEX quick check. Clients taking calcium channel blockers should avoid consuming what? Remember, that's going to be our grapefruit juice because it inhibits the metabolism of these medications, which can cause toxicity. And lastly, what time of day should diuretics be administered? Well, remember, we said we're going to give those in the morning because if we give them at night, the client's going to have to urinate all through the night, which is going to disrupt sleep and potentially create a fall risk. All right, you are good to go for antihypertensives on the NCLEX.